Cairo, Seattle. It's time to get schooled with a professor, John Clayton. Welcome to Schooled with a Professor, and of course, uh, with the free agency period just about ready to start, the salary cap numbers are in. We've got to talk salary cap, because again, you know how geeky I am on this stuff. I mean, I got my databases and everything else, and right now, we got a chance to uh, really get into some good stuff with Andrew Brandt, who of course writes for MLQB.com, and he's got on the Bleacher Report, and worked with him at ESPN, worked with him in so many different places, and know him for so many years. But, you know, want to get into the salary cap, and the evolution of it, and where it's headed and where it's come from. And how, if, as you look in the big picture, you know, when they put the salary cap in in 1993, has it gone like you expected or has it veered in so many different ways? Yeah, John, and great to be with you. I mean, the salary cap was always a trade off back in 93. And that time I was an agent before I, I turned to the team side. And the trade off was the owners are going to get their cap in exchange for the players getting free agency. And the cap was a function at that time of designated gross revenues by the league, which, again, were limited numbers of revenues. And over time, that number, the pot, if you will, has grown to become basically all revenues with carve-outs for things like sweet sales and relocation fees and things like that. And then it's always been a negotiation between the union and the league for the percentage and again, the percentage is not the important number. It's the percentage of what. So I think it's kind of taken twists and turns with the cap. I think the one thing that's gotten different, John, is teams getting smarter about the cap. And this is probably everything we talk about, you talk about with analytics and younger and maybe more uh, less footballish guys coming into these team offices and really understanding the finances, the mechanics of the cap better. And I think that's a big reason why teams have gotten smarter with the cap. When I say smarter, they're structuring deals better. They're not doing this kind of push the can down the road so they get in trouble, as has happened to so many teams that have gotten good and then had to mortgage the future and face cap jail. So I think the main twists and turns are teams getting smarter, understanding it better, understanding how to structure contracts better, and working around so they're not strapped in future years. So the cap is a working model. I always likened it, John, to sort of stuffing an octopus into a box. There was always something hanging out. No, and of course, that's that's the thing that I've always signed so much fun because, again, I still remember, I mean, going back into the Plan B free agency and how that novel was, and then finally you get into this whole thing and the dynamics of it because, you know, things move so fast. I mean, you really, if you don't have something within four or five days of free agency, then, of course, uh, you know, it moves. But what I'm wondering about now as we look ahead, you know, the contracts growing at the pace that they're going, how many of these big contracts can fit in? Because when you're talking, for example, uh, you know, $27, $28 million for a quarterback, you know, that's eating up more than 15 percent of a cap in a certain year. You know, some years it's going to be a little less than the cap number at the beginning and then more at the end. And it really kind of paralyzes to figure out how many more big contracts can you fit in well i've you know i've always pushed back a little on that because i've done this i actually you know i had the highest paid player in the league for 10 years named brett Favre, and i never wanted to use the excuse of that to field a quality team and in fact i didn't want to use the excuse of that to mortgage the future for him and not field a quality team for the next guy who ended up being aaron Rodgers. so i just think what what the system of the NFL gives you as a team manager is an ability to balance your big contracts with, pick a number, 50, 60% of your team, maybe 70% on some teams, under rookie deals. And the new CBA mandates a couple things. Number one, all rookie deals must be four-year deals. That's an incredible leverage for teams to have these guys on these fixed, reasonable contracts for four years. Number two, you can't even renegotiate for three years. So you get a guy like Russell Wilson who's woefully underpaid, and you can't even do anything about it, even if the team wants to and the player wants to. That's the situation now with 
with Carson Wentz, with players like that, that haven't reached three years, you can't even negotiate. So uh, this is a way you can certainly balance bigger contracts. Now, how many, quote-unquote, elite contracts? I think, you know, a team kind of looks at maybe four, five, six. If you have an elite quarterback, if you have an elite uh, tackle, if you have an elite corner, if you have an elite defensive lineman, you can fit those in. You just have to balance your cap with younger players. And you do that because by nature, every team is going to have, I don't know, the average six, seven, eight picks a year, and they don't wash out for a few years, you're going to have 30 picks in recent years on your team. So these are the kind of things that you look for when balancing out the cap. And I just think, you know, you see teams that are able to do it with big quarterbacks. I think, this is my pet peeve, it's a real cop-out for a team to say, yeah, we can't build a quality team around, pick a name, Andrew Luck, Joe Flacco. You know, those are two teams that have kind of used that excuse, and I, I just don't believe it. No, that's true, and uh, you know the one advantage, and of course that's the that's the one big change because I mean, you've watched it go a couple ways, and really it kind of started to a degree here in Seattle, but it happened when Rick Meyer uh, that year, uh, people were coming up with creative ways of getting around the rookie contracts, and so it was a hard rookie pull, much like it is right now, but they were able to get option bonuses in there, and those option bonuses ultimately started taking you know the top picks in the draft, particularly the quarterbacks and making more money than the Tom Brady's and the quarterbacks that were already there and making the rookies among the higher-paid players, which, of course, was fixed in 2011. Yeah, not only was it fixed, like a thing I talked to you about and not able to renegotiate, I mean, they took a haircut to the rookies. And it's interesting, John, because I talked to a friend of mine that has no idea what goes on in the NFL or sports, but he's involved with labor unions. And it was so familiar it was so familiar because what he said is, oh, yeah, the easiest people to, for, uh, pardon my French, screw in, in labor deals are the future. <laughs> and that's what they do with other labor unions. And we are now seeing they certainly do it with the NFL because the people that took major haircuts in this new CBA are now at seven years old are the people that were not part of the union when it was negotiated. And they are still coming in every year, and they're still coming in the next three years before this one expires, and they'll be coming in when the next one expires, because this is what happens. You've got the owners at the table, and they all agree, oh, yeah, these rookies make too much, especially at the top. And these contracts are ridiculous, like you said with Meyer, these second options, these ways of getting around the rookie pool. We're getting rid of all that. And then who are they negotiating with? They're negotiating with, at the time, the Jeff Saturdays and Dominic Foxworth and older players who are like, yeah, Dot Drew Brees, like, yeah, we don't want them making more than us. So that was the easiest issue of all to negotiate because everyone's saying, yeah, there's no voice at the table for rookies. The only voice that would potentially be at the table is what you mentioned, is the agents because – they can use those big contracts to negotiate for their veterans. and But, you know, the Tom Condons and Drew Rosenhauses of the world, they're not at the bargaining session, and they're not invited, and they're not listened to. Uh, so you see what happens. The younger players take the shaft compared to everyone else, and it's, an, it's a novel way to do business. And as I said, I hear about it in other labor unions as well. So they go ahead and they have a rookie pool that, you know, basically takes so much out where, you know, really you're only going to have maybe two, three guys making $7 million a year at the top of the draft. All right. So now the idea was we'll take that money and we'll give it to the vets. But there was no guarantee that was going to go to the vets. Yeah, there was a minimum spend guarantee of 89% of the cash, uh, of the cap over four-year period for cash. But that doesn't necessarily take those mid, or those low-priced veterans. And so all of a sudden, you had guys that could have been making two, three, four million dollars, making minimum salary. So it didn't go to the veterans that they thought it would. 
The great mystery of the CBA, John, is what you just said. Where is that money going? Because, you know, when you, you take the obvious examples, like uh, Sam Bradford in the last year of the old CBA, first pick, $50 million guaranteed. Cam Newton, first pick in the new CBA, $22 million guaranteed. That's $38 million, I'm sorry, $28 million with one player. Mm-hmm. So you take all that, there were estimates that's $200 million saved with the change in the first round alone, and you you mentioned, you know, I'm at a loss like you. Where is that money going other than owners' pockets? And I know there are minimum spends, and I've written about this, and I've talked about this on ESPN. That, to me, is the biggest deficiency of the CBA. The minimums are way too low and judged over a way too long a period. There are two judgment points in the CBA. The first two years weren't even, you could spend whatever you wanted and however little you wanted. The judgments are from 2013 to 17 and 17 to 20. And they look at a four-year period and did, did the team spend 89% of their cap on these players? And if they didn't, obviously there would be penalties and you have to give money to certain players. But you know how easy that is, John? It's easy because if you just take the straight cap, over four years you can average, so it's 11%, you can average almost 4% a year under the cap in spending and meet those minimums. But here's the real problem. These are taken off the actual cap, which just came out as $177 million. The minimums do not apply with the adjusted caps and teams are rolling over because they're not spending they're rolling over tens of millions of dollars in cap room so a team like san francisco or cleveland in 2018 does not have a cap of 177 million they have caps this just came out from the nflpa of 233 million for san francisco and 236 million for cleveland now, when it comes to minimum spending, are they judged on those numbers? No. They are judged on the $177 million number, which to me is San Francisco, Cleveland, and many others truly gaming the system. Mm-hmm. They are not spending what it was supposed to happen. And we can do the math, but whatever 89% of 177 is, I don't know, John. That's probably like 60% of 233, Yeah, maybe 50%. Uh, so that is really a travesty for the players. Go back in history and kind of educate us. on Because remember, it used to be a 59% of the revenue. And, of course, that was there were some deductions and added and all that. Now, you know, it was 47%. But technically this year, because it was a little bit of a downturn, uh, you take it down every couple of years, a half a half a percent it's 46 percent of the uh of the of the revenue of the league and so what's now a 14 15 billion uh, dollar league i mean 46 percent is a big dip how did it get down there so much in the last cba well let's take you through that that you mentioned that higher number 59 percent that gets back to what i talked about with designated gross revenues so the pot was smaller the percentage was bigger and I, I think back to the leader of the union at that time, Gene Upshaw, a great player with the Raiders, great leader for the union. He used to make his annual visit to when I was at Green Bay in Lambeau, and he was there, I remember, a couple of years right after we uh, renovated and we got the, the, the tours and we had the atrium with the shops and everything else. I just remember him sitting in my office looking down over all that revenue-producing activity. And he just shook his head. He said, we got to get a piece of this. He literally said that. We got to get a piece of this. And you know what? In the next CBA, they did. And kudos to DeMaury Smith and his crew, because that is now the new equation. It's all revenue. And like I said, there's still exclusions for things like uh, seat revenue at, at club levels and, of course, these relocation fees of Oakland chargers in st louis they don't players don't get a penny of that but it's now all revenues here but but the percentage goes down so what we're we came out with 59 percent of designated revenues 
I'm told, again, I'm not an economist, that worked out to about a 50-50. That Mm -hmm. worked out to about a net-net 50 players, 50 owners percentages. Now we're in this all revenue category, so the 50% would match that, but they don't have 50%. They negotiated this band in this new CBA, and again, it's more for economists, but the band goes from 46 to 48% depending on the year and depending on markers of the previous year, which you just mentioned, and I haven't gotten into this yet with the league as to how it went down. So this is 46% of the all revenue designation has now equaled the cap for 2018, 177 million, coming up about 10 million from last year, but it went up 12 million the year before. So I'm not sure what happened here because we read about the NFL continuing to be very strong in revenue production, that the players are not getting this. But I'll just end again on that point that the bigger problem is the, 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 the teams have the cap room, John. The cap room is not the issue. It's spending the cap. <laughs> now I know, yeah, there are teams like Philadelphia and a couple others that are going to be tight against the cap, but the vast majority, they have the cap room. Are they going to spend it? Or are they going to roll it over again like some of these teams are doing? Well, here's one thing that's kind of grown in the last couple of years, because I track this, is the amount of money that's lost in injuries. Because you know now, if you're a capologist like you were, and you were negotiating a deal and trying to get your team ready for the cap, you literally have to have $10 million put aside, one for the draft, and the rest for replacements for injury players. Because you're going to be told, because now I think teams are averaging 17 players on the injured reserve list per team. Some teams like Baltimore, they have like 22. And, you know, sometimes you get a little offset, sometimes you don't. But that's a lot of money that's tied up in things that don't go on the field. Yeah, I'm a pretty risk-averse guy, and frankly, you need that in the role I had with the Packers for 10 years and as a cap manager. I want You mentioned $10 million for rookie pool and injuries. I wanted to go into the season after signing the rookies with $10 million. That was kind of the number I targeted mm-hmm. that we got injuries and, more importantly, getting extensions done because I thought that was the best use of remaining cap room in December and November to get extensions done, and I – did a lot in my time with a Chad Clifton or a Donald Driver or uh, many players with the Packers during that time, Greg Jennings, etc. So we always looked at it that way. And, yeah, I mean, again, what you try to do is the way I always phrase it, John, was pay as you go. So I always try to match up our cash with our cap. And I'll give people an example. You know, Signing bonuses are prorated, and my version, my attitude towards signing bonus were they're the devil because you can push out cap room with the signing bonus, but it'll always come and get you. So if I had a player making a $5 million uh, cap number or $5 million in cash, I would hope to be able to get as close as possible to $5 million in cap. Therefore, if things go south down the road, you're not in trouble with the leftover cap number. This got, has gotten Dallas in trouble so often where Tony Romo leaves the team and they've got a $19 million hole in their cap from Tony Romo. It happens with all these franchise quarterbacks that leave, and I always sort of learn from those lessons, trying to make sure, like I said, we didn't renegotiate Brett Favre's contract that way. You want to, again, match up cash and cap as much as you can. And if you get ahead of the curve, like teams like, Jacksonville and Cleveland and San Francisco are doing, and Tampa, you can do that. So you're not giving out signing bonuses. You're giving out big, large, guaranteed salary, or you're giving out salary plus roster bonus, which is not prorated. And you can have a 20, even a $20 million number. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, he's got a huge, he's got a cap number close to $30 million, which makes sense because they have the cap room. Why push it out? So I think teams are getting better at that. 
you know, no doubt. And of course, it's going to be fascinating just to see, you know, as this thing goes, how everybody gets under the cap and how everybody tries to maneuver and they can get any deals done. Hey, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. It's a great education on the salary cap, salary cap number in of 177.2 and free agency around the corner. Thanks for joining us with School with the Professor. Enjoyed it, John. Thank you. And that does it for this week's podcast. In between episodes, you can follow me on Twitter at Clayton ESPN. If you enjoy these weekly one-on-one conversations, consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show. Thanks for listening. See you next time on Schooled with the Professor.